Brandon. Hello. I'm JJ. How are you doing? Matthew joined. Okay, so he had himself marked tentative, so I wasn't sure. Good day. Hey, hey, uh, yeah, you're, you're right. I just uh, hopped on right now. Was there anyone that specifically uh, wanted to uh, facilitate today? If not, I can step in. I just didn't see anyone there in the, uh, the notes. So I just wanted to make sure there was uh, someone to take the helm. Sure, sure. No, go for it. Go for it. I would love for people. To... Okay, cool. At some point, I'll have to actually start doing some actual security reviews and not just uh, facilitating. Be... I just got to find more time in my schedule. That'll be amazing. Uh, it's also boring for the community to hear my and Brandon's boring voice all the time. <laughs> Mix it up. Morning, folks. Zoom video filter is kind of neat. Yeah, the, the green screen effect, it's creating like a halation effect around your hair sort of thing. It's like the hair is moving what? in waves in the wind. <laughs> <laughs> okay, I'll quickly pull up the, uh, the yeah. planned meeting notes and uh, just formulaically go through the uh, usual ho hum. It, yeah, so I, I think I did an add this in, but uh, I think we are planning if we have time of the, the review, which I'm guessing we probably will. Uh, I think Aradna is on, and then she can talk about uh, some of the stuff that um, for CSA that she didn't manage to cover the last time. Sure, happy to. Brandon, thank you. Awesome. Let's see, so we have a dozen people on. I'll just one or two more minutes. At the same time, they'll give me a chance to put an input for today's meeting. Nope. Set up for it's Santiago I'm guided sorry, by the, the, pass, the passcode. <laughs> I'm sharing with him now. Okay, looks like we've got critical mass. Uh, good day, everyone. Uh, today's uh, CNCF SIG security meeting. Uh, my name is Matthew. I'm an occasional fil facilitator here. I've been offline, I think, for about a month and a half as we had other more interesting <laughs> people that handle the facilitation and presentations. So um, before we proceed, I just need to see if we can get uh, one or two scribes. Oh, yes, link to the meeting notes. Be sure to merge yourself in attendance. Thank you, Emily, that's in the chat there. Um, uh, is there anyone that would like to volunteer as a scribe slash minute taker today? All right, looks like we've got someone volunteering for the role. Thank you, Ash. Perfect. I generally try and avoid typing while I am talking just because it can be distracting and I won the loudest keyboard award at work with my uh, mechanical keyboard there. So I feel I'm doing everyone's ears a favor and what not by not typing. So, all right, our members here. All right, so then I'm just gonna go through the attendance here and just see what updates we have here. So Emily's appears to be interesting. Uh, would you care to take the lead, Emily? Uh, um, over 600 folks signed up for Security Day, which is really awesome. So if you have not signed up yet, please be sure that you do so. 
Um, and as far as the cognitive security white paper goes, we've opened it up for community review. We've had over a hundred comments so far. Um, JJ Aradna and myself have, sorry, Amy. Uh, JJ, myself and Aradna have gone through and done a lot to adjudicate all of the comments um, that we've been receiving. So if you haven't had a chance to look over the doc, please do so. Awesome, thanks, Emily. Uh, would you be able to throw a link to sign up uh, in the chat as well, please? Or is that the one that Brandon posted? Oh, thank you. Okay, now let's see. Uh, have any check-ins from any other SIGs or technical groups? It does not appear to be the case. So I'll just go through this as they see. So no dates, no dates, any of this. Uh, Brandon. Good day. Would you care to grab the mic? Yeah, sure. Thanks. <clears throat> um, so quick update on the security assessment uh, working group. So uh, we got together for the past two weeks. Um, we got a lot of good feedback on, you know, what some of the problems and ideas. Uh, we've consolidated it and put it into different categories in the mirror board, which I'm going to uh, paste in chat. Uh, the next step for this is I'm synthesizing uh, all this information and I'm going to create issues um, around like each of the, the big topics and then we're hoping that you know if, if you see that this is something that you're interested in working on um, you know anyone should feel free to to take the lead on any of these issues. Thanks Brendan. Okay going through the list let's see if we have I don't believe I see any uh, updates from individuals, and I don't see any SIG or vendor check-ins here. So I have a with that I believe request. is. Oh, go ahead. Hi, I put in. Um, I started annotating people that um, I knew were SIG co-chairs and tech leads, and some a couple of people with projects. And please, in your attendance, if you are a maintainer of a project or work on a project um, that is in CNCF or another open source project. Um, it, or um, if you are responsible for you're working on something with the SIG, please annotate your attendance with what you are working on, so that uh, you know. So you're, it kind of helps people get to know each other a little bit because our meetings have gotten fairly big, which is great. Um, but then sometimes it's hard to know who's at the meeting. So if you could self-identify, then people might reach out to you on chat. Awesome, thank you, sir. I realize I keep providing a thumbs up and my camera's not on, but I'll fix that next time. Uh, okay, with that said, I don't see any additional check-ins, but I do see one proposed topic, at least from the very top of the document, um, the question mark, in toto, if I got that right, in toto incubation review. Is there uh, anyone that would like to grab the mic on that? Yeah, I don't know if uh, you want to take a mic on that, Brendan, or, or just have me go edit it. Yeah, so so I think that the discussion from last week was that um, we would discuss, you know, what other kind of since we've had the security assessment, uh, what are some of the changes, uh, what I uh, you looking for, and what the CNCF um, kind of asks on the recommendations, and then you know, we can discuss some of this um, and kind of get a consensus of uh, what we should, uh, one of the co-chairs should add the document. Right, so uh, to get some context, the uh, internal security review was the first review, like for, for those that weren't familiar with uh, in total was the first security review or self-assessment that was done on uh, on a CNCF project. This was when Intoto was originally applying for incubation. Uh, this was about a year and a couple of months ago. Um, back then, the recommendation from SIG Security was to essentially allow it to get into incubation and probably have uh, the CNCF uh, allocate some funds to help us with uh, uh, some HCI researcher uh, or HCI uh, person, knowledgeable person to help us uh, improve the mental models for uh, users to better use Intoto. 
Now, um, during the application, in total, pretty much felt like in the line between incubation and uh, sandbox. So uh, back then, it felt uh, safer to just uh, get into sandbox. And then when, um, when some time passed in terms of like adoptions and uh, project maturity, collaboration and such, uh, then to apply for incubation. And well, that all happened. Uh, but what feels uh, to me, at least in my interpretation, is that the original uh, review that was mostly focused on how uh, how do we secure a process? Has there been a thorough uh, like security analysis of the architecture of the software? Uh, how do we manage uh, vulnerabilities? How do we um, how do we onboard new people? How do we uh, manage trust within their organization and such? Um, which all of those things uh, haven't changed fundamentally. Uh, in fact, I think the, the recommendation still is current. We haven't had the resources, particularly because uh, since we got in as a sandbox project, I think the CNCF doesn't, uh, uh, doesn't support uh, sandbox projects like with money that much or like as strongly as it would do for an incubation project and pro perhaps to, uh, to fund uh, staff to do HCI uh, research. Now, um, also, since uh, we were mostly uh, on the bar for incubation because of adoption and contributor count, uh, I think those are the changes that we have seen on Intoto in the last year. Um, I don't know if this is the if this is the context that's needed to like for six security to kind of review the situation. Now, uh, fast forward. A year uh, passes. Uh, I speak with uh, Michelle Morali, uh, who's sponsoring us for the incubation review, and, um, and part of the process is to actually. I mean, a lot of things have changed since, but uh, it, now we do need a uh, six security to give a uh, like a we saw this project and it looks like uh, like a good project or like it has been security uh, there has been a security audit. Well, not audit. Security uh, self-review, self-assessment. Um, so that is part of what we need in the due diligence document, uh, which I shared on the on the Slack channel. Um, the due diligence document, I think, uh, all the way in the bottom has uh, essentially a slot for uh, somebody on the, I guess, on the assessment working group to uh, take a look and uh, put the recommendation. My understanding is that. Or again, this is my bias uh, position uh, is that it is uh, it could be as simple as just taking the old recommendation and uh, considering that essentially nothing has changed in that regard uh, to move it forward to the new due diligence document. Now, I am not comfortable doing that because there is clearly a conflict of interest there. I am I'm here with security, but I am also a the person who's pushing for incubation. So. Uh, so I was hoping that uh, somebody in the group would, with enough uh, uh, lack of uh, conflict of interest would be comfortable just taking a look at the old uh, recommendation. Uh, I think I shared the slides last week and, uh, and uh, just either reward it in a way that they're more comfortable with or just uh, move it, uh, or just move it over. Uh, actually, okay, yeah. And uh, I think there's a couple of people that I didn't get access and that's my bad. I should have just let it open. Um, but yeah, if there's any questions I would love to hear or like any points that I missed. So Santiago, this is uh, Vinay here. So, uh, you know, from, from that perspective, I've uh, been part of one of the assessments in the past. Uh, uh, I'm curious as to what exactly the ask is and how uh, and what kind of uh, assistance is needed uh, to remove that bias. So, so, so let me chime in uh, here a little bit, I guess. Um, so the I think the context is that um, in the CNCF process, there's a requirement for the SIG to give recommendation. Um, and this usually comes in the form of, uh, here's, um, so what we did with OPA was like, we, we said, okay, we did an assessment, uh, here were the findings, 
uh, the team has uh, worked on making progress towards um, fixing some of these findings or uh, you know the, the recommendation still stands. And usually there is uh, some kind of like informal sign off by, by a, a co-chair. Oh. Yeah, so uh, I, my, my interpretation of it at least is that um, the sign off by, by the co-chairs are kind of what creates the, uh, an unbiased, like sort of defined unbiased view. Got it, thank you. Yeah. Yeah, and I don't think it's just the sign, just to chime in. It's not just the sign up by the co-chair, it's that um, Santiago is an active member of SIG security and could normally write up a due diligence document that a co-chair would just review and, you know, and if they're aligned, sign off on. However, since he's the project, lead project maintainer, it's not really appropriate for him to write that document. And like you said, we've done most of the legwork anyhow. But um, so I think that there's the like, the conflict of interest is really just Santiago's dual role as a member of SIG security and a, you know, active participator, right? And PAC participant and, um, and his role in the project. And so that's where Vinay, you could step in and, you know, do a, you know, a short write-up that addresses the incubation criteria. And, um, you know, and then, uh, you know, one of the co-chairs could say, yep, because I think we're all fairly familiar with Intoto. Um, at least JJ and I um, were very active in, you know, this very first <laughs> security assessment. And so, um, you know, either one of us um, is familiar with the project enough to uh, probably give that a quick review. Um, while I've got the mic, I did have one quick follow-up question which I don't know whether you've addressed Santiago in your documentation, but I wanted to sort of highlight for the group, I put in the chat a link to the, um, the, the, the summary slide. It's actually got all of the projects or three of the projects that um, have summary slides, um, but I, I moved in total to the top. And um, one of the things that was like, got it, made it be sort of on the fence between um, sandbox and incubation for us was that there was just one public case study um, where we understood, we, we just didn't have the, um, you know, we weren't familiar enough with the CNCF process to understand how important that usage was, you know, in this process. And there was actually usage, but, it, you know, for security focused projects, it's a pretty high bar to get somebody to say in public that they're using them. And so th in this case, um, you know, I don't know if there are more public case studies, but certainly it would be appropriate to share in private what's happening. And um, if there are more um, companies that we could as, you know, a, you know, a member of SIG Security could do a deep dive and learn more about Who's using the projects and potentially, you know, even speak to one of them if that was a concern, and um, do that under confidentiality, and then report. Yes, we, you know, right. there are multiple case studies. So that's another way where a member of Six Security could step up and participate in this due diligence that I think particularly security-focused projects have a need for. That's a great point, and uh, I'm glad you brought it up because I didn't even think about it. But uh, I know that Michelle Norali was the and I think this is kind of understood by the TLC that uh, now that some of the case studies can be interviews with companies. So I wonder if we can do both and have like a six security assessment person and a member of the TLC be part of the interview with the company. And that's essentially what I'm arranging now. Um, uh, I, think that, I, I think that's a good idea. Uh, should I just uh, bring it up with uh, Michelle maybe? See what she thinks. Yeah, I would. Uh, yeah, I mean to add to Sarah's thing, there is precedence to this already in, uh, say, Contour with uh, Sig Network, and there have been like that's for project verification and validation. So, I would just go ahead and do it and let uh, FYI, Michelle. Uh, okay. Sounds good. Yeah, uh, I'll do that. Um, 
another unrelated uh, like point that I, I don't know if there has been a lot of conversation around it, but I feel it feels to me that security projects also have a, a higher, uh, like it is more difficult for security focused projects to have as much adoption as say a core or like network mm -hmm. projects. And uh, I wonder what the take of uh, security is of that and when it comes to like a recommendation. It feels to me that uh, it is hard to contrast like all of the stars that uh, Kubernetes has on a Git repository with like say tough. And both of them are graduated projects, but like there's only so many people in security. Yeah. Yeah, I mean it's I can't it's, uh, it's, no Pardon, uh, go ahead, sir. I, we got a bit of lag on my mic here. So yeah, actually maturity, like that like bullet point in the slide has been the hardest thing for the different projects to say like, what do you even mean by this, right? And um, the reason that we, I felt that it was important to speak to and we could, got aligned on that being like a, a thing that was part of the assessment is that when you're assessing the risk of a project, um, how many other people have adopted it is part of that, right? And it's really not, do you adopt the project or not? It's how much are you now a participant in developing the project versus you can just rely on everybody else has already checked the box. So it's, and you know, it's not that, it's more that there's validation from multiple companies and different types of projects will have different types of, you know, it, it's qualitative, it's not quantitative. So, you know, and it doesn't have to be a written case study, right? It, and, you know, personally, I'm not, I don't care about GitHub stars because that's like popularity contest. It doesn't mean somebody's actually using it. Um, so I care more about, is it being used in a substantive way in the way that we can believe that this isn't just, you know, oh, this was adopted, this is a company, this is something that was made, it's been adopted by one company and it's really not gonna go anywhere, right? I don't think Intoto's in this camp. I think, you know, we've seen a lot of traction. The, que the challenge is how do you articulate that, tr that traction in a genuine way that's appropriate to the project in the sector? Right. And so that's just a creative challenge. I, I agree. Uh, it just, uh, I think it, uh, not, not only the, for the Intoto context, but I think it, in, in a sense, it, it, uh, it worries me uh, that uh, there's a handicap for security projects in that sense, and that it's harder for them to get supported just because they have this limitation that they're somewhat niche to some extent. Um, I don't know if this, if this is like, well, I think that well, I would like security projects to be a little less niche than they are. <laughs> right, which that's that's part of the consequence of this like self-fulfilling like a uh, feedback loop, right? Uh, it is harder for them to get adopted, uh, but then we uh, it is harder for them to get visibility because they are not like they're competing with projects that naturally are a little bit more uh, easy to adopt. To say it's somehow. Perhaps it's useful framing not to think of it as competition, neither as being proportional. But if you think of, you're, you're talking more about public adoption than adoption, because there's a confidentiality nature that people are not going to say out loud, this is what, what do we do for security. Yeah, and I also want to bring in for, for Spiffy and Spire, uh, we had similar questions and Brian Grant at the time who was in the TOC said, well, just, just flip it around. If any of these companies, and let's talk about in total, you were to remove their supply chain logs, would they be able to run their infrastructure? And if the answer is no, this means this, this is being used in a meaningful way that is critical for that business operation or for that infrastructure operation. Right. Uh, what I mean is, um, you like. I, I think there's a fundamental difference between uh, you say you're building Kubernetes, right, and then on top of that you're securing Kubernetes. Now, one of them predates the other just by like a natural consequence of 
one of them is a thing, the other one is securing the thing. Now, um, say that uh, after that, there is something that is Kubernetes plus plus that is likely to get more visibility just because the target audience is everybody. Whereas uh, a security product by itself, it is limited to people that want to provide security properties to a product. Um, and I, I don't think it is a competition. I think it's just a, a natural consequence of uh, e like security being a subset of the whole world of computing. Um, it would be it would be similar to saying, well, uh, say that both there was like Linux Foundation projects, uh, like a, as a big umbrella, and you put the Linux kernel to compete with Kubernetes. Early on, mm -hmm. I think Kubernetes would have a harder time convincing people that it was as relevant as the Linux kernel, and even today, well, some people would could try to make that argument. And I, I think this is a really good point, right? Like, and I. I believe that, you know, from different TOC members and that I've talked to, that this is understood, like that if it's a new project that you can just add on to your cloud native deployment, there's probably a higher bar for the quantity of customers or the profile of customer to know that like, oh, this isn't just you got three of your friends to add it on, right? Whereas if it's a security focused project, you know, three companies may be a huge number, right? Because it has to be, there's a high bar for the company to adopt it. And it's, you know, for something like Intoto, you know, or like OPA, it's like any of these things, right? Sp Spiffy, spy, like these become a core part of the infrastructure, right? So I think that people understand, like it's, you don't need a large quantity. It's just that you need to show that it's more than one which could be by private disclosure, and that they're different enough, they're dis they're different enough, right? That they're not like, oh, these two friends decided to do it at their companies, right? And it's not that it's not that I care that if you if anybody promotes their project through, you know, social interaction and friendship, it's more that we are making a commitment when we move something to incubation and we want to feel like it's got some traction, whatever that means. Like it's, 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 it's proved itself a little bit, right? So that people are relying, multiple people are relying on it. And it's likely that another company could use it in the same way. Right. No, I, I fully agree. And, uh, I the, the question, the reason why I brought it up, it's not, not necessarily connected to Intoto. I think Intoto has every, everything it needs. It is more of me uh, worrying a little bit about the security ecosystem uh, as a whole. And I think, uh, I don't know what the answer is because I, I, I don't think, uh, I mean, I, I feel that in one hand we could say like, oh, security products then have different standards, but I don't think that's fair because I also know that observability has probably its own problems say uh, runtime will have its own like understanding of what, a, um, of what an adopted project is. Um, I also think that uh, there's this like tacit understanding, as you said, Sarah, Sarah that like a lot of people understand that security products are, uh, have different uh, adoption challenges. Uh, I just wanted to bring that up. Uh, and uh, yeah, and yeah I, don't, I don't think I can tell for sure. That, I uh, think you were saying so, something different too, that there's a limit by nature of being like a total totally different category or a totally different market where you may only have a size of 10 total people to reach versus Kubernetes may have a thousand. Right. I, yeah, so I mean, I want to add something to that conversation. So... <clears throat> The reason why uh, we formed SIG Security outside of Kubernetes as a community is pre precisely to acknowledge and understand that. Right? So security is a cross-cutting concern across multiple infrastructure and its profile and uh, uh, projects and adoptions are gonna look a lot different than what Kubernetes adoption is gonna look like. Um, and I think it's been acknowledged and well understood uh, by CNCF in general, but I think there is still, to your point, uh, the lack of clarity <clears throat> or a lack or incorrect expectations in terms of like what 
uh, something should look like versus what something is and what something's usefulness of it is right so um, and i don't know if you'll be if we'll be able to find like a magic answer that says like okay yeah we do x uh, <clears throat> at x percentage of y this makes sense kind of thing uh, it is just going to have to be like this constant conversations like this and then i uh, have some um, uh, like things like assessment be a guiding force for like why this matters because people that are in security understand the context around this that will be able to assess and validate and uh, push uh, and now we have this forum to basically do exactly just that right so i think it's going in the right direction to your point no uh, it's very less understood uh, but is there a common consensus and a uh, mechanism to push this through i think we've started having that part of uh, the six security uh, but your inputs and your uh, quote unquote evangelization around this will also help in terms of uh, trying to move the needle on that right yeah uh, I, i agree i um and yeah um i think uh, i also don't have a lot of visibility of how uh, doc be used things so i assume that also yeah without that knowledge it's, it's easy for me to catastrophize to some extent <laughs> yeah exactly i think like what sara was saying uh, core infra projects will have this challenge right? so uh, adoption uh, aradhana has uh, thing there in terms of adoption with cloud providers so that will be something that you can double click on or if you have any stories around it that will also add to the validation of the project jj one last thing is i don't think they use one single measuring stick for all projects yeah. and you can always reach out to the members of the toc jokingly yeah. someone has said hey treat the toc as a as a hit list and just go one by one yeah <laughs> and talk to them but uh they're actually uh yeah they they will have different perspectives each that would be it'd be good for you to to figure out what what they're all uh talking talking to Michelle about something unrelated tomorrow on SMI but uh happy to bridge this too no i i think that's all that's all good i and i don't i don't i think uh i really appreciate Michelle's perspective i think my my concern was mo- mostly on having uh very delineated numbers for example say three adoptions uh again i think three is a reasonable number for incubation but at the same time it also feels that uh it is a like it is not a qualitative measure it is a quantitative one that's <sighs> all right i'll uh... thank you that was Yeah, Matthew. Oh, go ahead, JJ. If you had something to say, I no, was no, just going to move on to the PR if, uh, before I wrapped up. No, I was just okay. Going to... So, so, go ahead. Gotcha. All right. So, going through, I don't have any issues or PRs for general session or any listed that require chair approval. Are there any PR that anyone would like to bring up or bring visibility to right now? If not, we'll move on to just in the floor and wrapping up. Um so I have one fellow co-chairs uh there is an open PR that does need your review and approval and Brandon I think you might have already looked at it so most recent one when you look at the queue Oh yeah uh Andreas do you want to talk about that So yeah message in chat Yeah, it looks like you got pulled away. Oh, yeah. Okay. Um Emily, which issue are you talking about? Is this the one with changes to the 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 governance? Yeah, it's issue um 430 and PR 431. Okay. I think we have one outstanding comment that needs to be resolved. Okay. Yeah, I I got it. I'll take it. Okay. Yeah. Are are we going to bring that one up uh, on screen or a wrap for that ticket? 
I'll take it offline. Uh, I think I, I can do that. Okay. Next, I don't see anything else in the back for today. So, um, uh, I then think if there's any, I, I think Aratna um, has something to share on for CSA. If she's um, in the call today. Yeah, I'm here, uh, Randon. How are you today? Okay. Um, okay. Yeah, I can share uh, what is going on um, with containers and microservices at CSA, um, and to also talk about the serverless working group that uh, we are working on. So um, there's a, a special working group that was created about two years ago, containers and microservices um, under CSA, where um, they have already published two papers. One is on challenges for operators uh, and users of uh, containers and microservices. And it, it's already published, so you can um, search for it and download it. And the second one is best practices for microservices and application containers that is also published. Um, obviously there's evolution, so they'll be evolving that paper um, and research further, but those two are available as it is right now. Uh, more work to be done there. Um, this year we started a working group um, as a subset of this particular uh, work stream to work on serverless security. Um, so I can share some slides. I'm repurposing slide deck from uh, another presentation that I gave a few months ago. So basically um, this was a presentation given um, at the CSA EU summit um, to evangelize the working group and get some volunteers to help with the um, initiative and efforts. So basically um, the, the research is talking about how we have evolved in the infrastructure space. Initially, we were all using hosts and servers, and then we moved on to virtual machines. And what are the challenges with virtual machines? And now we are on containers and Kubernetes. And how um, more and more enterprises are looking at functions um, to use the, uh, the functions as um, you know, full application functionality. So multiple functions uh, orchestrated to build an application functionality and why that is attractive to um, developers and enterprises. Um, obviously, there's a lot to be done when uh, you're building a container platform, as you all know, uh, the intricacies of securing a container platform, um, as well as developers have still have work to do to package all the application and dependencies in the container and deploy them. But functions remove that dependency as well. You just purely write business functions and use a functionality provided by the uh, cloud provider to go and deploy the application functionality. Again, then definition of what is serverless. We had a lot of conversation around serverless. What does serverless mean? Um, because um, there's container as a service offerings. Uh, there are container as service offerings from cloud providers, which are also serverless technically, um, even though in reality, they're not serverless. Um, it's just that the functionality is obfuscated from the application owners. So hence we, in this paper, we are covering container as a service as well as function as a service aspects as well. And then obviously we talk about shared responsibility model for different deployment models. Um, IAS, we are all familiar. If we build our own container platform and say AWS, we have to do everything, including implementation of Kubernetes and orchestration engine, hardening of that, and um, also the runtime control plane as well as the um, data plane as well. Um, and there, I have seen organizations do that as well. I've seen several people trying to deploy OpenShift in AWS um, for whatever reasons. Um, and over time, cloud providers have matured some of their services. So uh, it really um, forces people to think, why are we even doing that? Why don't we just use container as a service? But again, um, regulatory and um, organizations where there are regulations, they have to meet the kind of visibility and detection and control they need um, that kind of suffices their justification to do um, their own container platforms in cloud provider environments as well. And similarly, function as a service, is, there's still a stack of controls that um, the application developers uh, in an enterprise will control. So this is just to visualize that. Um, 
And then we are also talking about differences between FAS and CAS. Obviously, FAS is event-driven architecture, short-lived, um, like Lambda functions that have a maximum time to live 15 minutes, um, and uh, more agile. Um, they're not as portable. I mean, the whole advantage of uh, building applications and microservices and containers is that you can port them anywhere. Unfortunately, when you use functions as a service from a provider, they are not portable to another platform. Uh, whereas container as a service, obviously, it's managed control plane, um, but you can choose the longevity of your service that is going to live uh, in your data plane. And um, it's more configurable and it's a little more portable. I wouldn't say portability has been uh, much of a need today in the enterprises, um, especially in financial services. I've seen multiple enterprises, um, application teams have affinities to cloud providers. And I haven't seen them porting their applications from AWS to Azure or Google today. Um, they just build applications in a container platform in a particular provider environment. Um, maybe in future that situation will come, but right now, um, and, and also some of these microservices are using past services in the back end. Imagine building some functions or you know, applications and um, uh, containers using Aurora RDS, right? Um, how will you port that to SQL Server in Azure or similarly, um, you know, Google databases or any analytics capabilities there? If you are utilizing, you are kind of dependent on a cloud provider. And then we are just talking about why serverless, uh, what are the advantages of that? Um, in comparison to IaaS and PaaS, uh, this is just a generic uh, slide, I guess. Um, architectural changes, obviously. Uh, it's a constrained developer environment uh, when you're using function as a service. Um, there's an obfuscation of infrastructure and application platform. Segregation of duties is still important and how to deploy them, that is the need access to the management console and the service and then how we delegate access to services and um, how those services- Sorry, I, I hate to- Sorry. I hate to cut off the presenter, but I think someone has a hot mic. I think someone's typing. Uh, could everyone just do a quick uh, mic check there? I see one or two people are unmuted and I think they just need to mute. There we go. Sorry, please continue. No worries. Um, so um, it's hard to get visibility because they're so short-lived and cloud providers today provide some detection capabilities, but not to the level of detail that enterprises today need. So there's still a need for um, capabilities from third party providers that need to be deployed for serverless deployments. Um, our friend from Palo Alto can vouch for that. Um, basically, um, there was a company called PureSec, which was providing detection capabilities for um, functions and uh, Palo Alto acquired them as part of their Prisma suite. Now they provide that. And there are several other um, third party solutions there still. Um, service level agreements are still uncertain because uh, in the shared responsibility model, how a function is being codified is up to an application developer. So cloud providers are not providing any service level agreements. None of the three major cloud providers are providing any SLAs around function as a service and their performance. Um, boundaries um, are not there anymore. There are no network choke points um, that uh, exist per se. And applications are not tiered. They can be dynamic distributed anywhere um, and integrations can be very wide so boundaries in terms of application functions um, are untrusted so a lambda function could be talking an emr instance or a redshift instance uh, and so on and so forth um, in data manipulation um, functions there are special concerns about uh, integrity of the data not just confidentiality and how do you validate the integrity of data Eventually, if you're using functions to update your databases um, or doing any data manipulation activities. So in, in terms of inherent weaknesses, I mean, obviously no performance guarantees, limited security controls. Um, state management is hard. Like I said, monitoring and logging is critical, but a lot of it depends on the developer, what they want to log as well. And, um, that, that is true for any application. So um, 
in terms of maturity, um, there are still organizations who have banned functions, or use of functions for certain types of activities. For example, in financial services, because of the regulatory environment, um, we do not allow today data manipulation activities using functions because of all the concerns that I just mentioned. And also auditability, um, regardless of what service provider we use, we have to be able to provide audit logs and trails of all the financial transactions to our regulators. So um, that kind of limits some of the capabilities we can leverage and then tooling maturity um, still um, it's evolving in the market. And then we have some pictures, uh, which we are still kind of fine tuning. This is just a random picture showing that all the security controls and integrations that we need to build in authentication, authorization, vulnerability management, uh, even triggers, um, et cetera, for function as a service. And then in container as a service, we just kind of depicting the, the additional controls that a tenant is responsible for when it comes to container um, as a service control plane as well as the data plane. Um, even in the control plane, cloud providers do provide some flexibility for um, tenants to be able to go configure some of the configurations there, what images to use, etc. So in terms of security challenges, I mean, we've had a lot of discussions around um, threat model around this. And we have, um, since this presentation, we have evolved our threat model in the paper quite a bit. Um, and I'm happy to share the link with all of you so you can read and opine on it as well and provide input. Um, basically, misconfigurations. Um, these are distributed applications. Imagine updating stock prices on a website, right? Uh, all the functions that will go into that. Um, and the criticality of the data and inputs and uh, validation and confidentiality around that until the final price is published. Um, so being distributed, um, there are a lot of policy enforcement challenges and configuration challenges as well. Um, and testing, right? Obviously um, you need an environment where you can test it before you actually implement it in production. Um, Improper authentication authorization is a big concern, concern basically because of untrusted boundaries and functions can go and talk to a lot of other services. And so appropriate authentication authorization and implementation, that is critical. Um, policy violations, as we've talked, uh, the function is written inaccurately or uh, there, are, there are misconfigurations in the deployment of the function, then there'll be challenges in policy enforcement and the policy violations will be detected, but the function is so short-lived that you may not even be able to fix it in the time. Code vulnerabilities still can happen. I mean, this is, these, this is application functionality. Um, even triggers can be, uh, you know, uh, the injections, SQL injections, as well as even data injections that can affect the uh, capabilities of a function, what it can execute to. Runtime issues, obviously, um, because of code injections um, and denial of service can happen. Malicious traffic uh, could impact the resources that you're utilizing and the function may not be able to execute just because the resources finished before the function could execute the full functionality. Um, detection, uh, we've talked about it. There, there are numerous challenges in that space. Just getting logs from different components that a function is using and aggregating them and then doing detection on them is kind of challenging. And in an event-driven orchestrated system, um, failure detection can be after the fact, like after the event has failed, you might detect it. So imagine five different functions running and one of them failing, all the subsequent functions will fail as well, so. And then we are just talking about threats, right? Um, these threats you're all familiar with um, related to applications and they all apply to functions as a service as well. And um, after the threat model and detailed threats discussion, we are working on security controls that we need to deploy in a secure function as a service deployment. Um, not just function as a service, but also container, container as a service. So there are two parts to that section, that chapter, we're gonna discuss 
all the controls required and with an architecture diagram showing how all the threats we have talked about are going to be mitigated uh, for um, a fast implementation as well as uh, container service implementation. And then also talking a little bit about future direction and where this is headed um, as cloud providers improve their capabilities for so, uh, to mitigate some of these threats and provide more visibility to tenants. Um, so this is in short what we are working on uh, in CSA as part of the serverless working group. Thank you for listening. Are there any questions? Thank you for me? your presentation. Yeah, that was great. Uh, right now, is uh, these slides, would you be able to make them available as well? Yeah, happy to ship this to you. Uh, this is public data. Okay, great. <laughs> Not regulated, so. Uh, yeah, I like this list of uh, the threats that you're talking about. It kind of speaks to a lot of what, the work we're doing in the community. Right. Uh, thank you so much for the slides. Uh, I had two questions, and probably the first one is a little dumb, uh, and I apologize uh, if I missed it. Uh, but uh, can you talk a little bit more about the CSA and like, what is it? <laughs> Sure, uh, Cloud Security Alliance actually was incepted in 2007 and I've been part of CSA since then um, when all the cloud providers were just coming out with initial services, AWS was really small. Uh, so they do a lot of work um, in building best practices uh, for cloud in general. And that is IaaS, PaaS, SaaS, and they have slowly expanded into internet of uh, things and mobile security and everything. It's a uh, standards body that does um, work around security as well, uh, complementary to CNCF. Um, and um, I've been part of uh, CSA since then. I was part of the first CSA uh, best practices guide that came out in 2008 timeframe. Now they also provide certifications to cloud providers. I mean, not everybody can get a FedRAMP certification, right? If you know FedRAMP, it's quite complicated to get a FedRAMP certification. So a lot of small time SaaS providers and PaaS providers they go to CSA for getting their services certified from a security controls perspective. Um, and they, they have a cloud controls matrix as well, which provides, uh, which is mapped to NIST 800-53, but at the same time, it's written in a different flavor. It's also mapped to ISO standards. Um, but again, the due diligence that goes into FedRAMP and validation of controls of uh, providers is slightly more deep and uh, in depth compared to CSA um, audits and assessments, but still it does provide some level of assurance of a provider's security posture and framework that they are using operational best practices as well. Um, but there's a lot of research available. I'm happy to share the link of CSA research uh, and guidance that they've published so far. There are a lot of working groups where you can participate and volunteer um, and share your knowledge as well. Um, and you're welcome to join the serverless working group as well since you're all working on the cloud native stuff and some of us is cloud native, so. Thank you so much. Uh, I had a follow-up question that was, uh, I was mostly curious. Uh, you had this taxonomy in the end of like threats and you put insecure repositories as a separate thing as uh, supply chain compromises. Uh, do you know why you decided to separate them or? Um, that, that is basically where you're getting your code. If you're integrating any third party libraries, you may be pointing to insecure libraries like GitHub's or you know, Git repos where you're downloading software from. That's right. That's why to, to me, at least conceptually, and again, this is just my mental model. Not everybody has the same, but it, it felt that the supply chain compromises includes insecure repositories as well. Yeah, like I said, these slides are built quickly for a presentation. In no, 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 it's, it's not a criticism. I was just curious to, to know. Uh, it's always good to hear different like perspectives. And sometimes it's like, oh, there's a fundamental like difference there. That's like, uh, uh, um, uh, you're right. Uh, that, 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 that is covered in third party. Cool. Uh, uh, thank you so much. I really enjoyed it. Some compromise to Node.js library. Right. Oh, sorry. <laughs> Please continue. No, no, no I, I was just uh, saying that, yeah, I really enjoyed it. Uh, Thank you. 
I was going to say Node.js, I think, is recently in the news. That's an example of both of those compromised uh, repos and supply chains. I don't think it's the first time that you do. Yeah, that's a good point. Node.js is perfect for saying, like, look at how scary things can get if you don't take care of it. And I'm, I'm not trying to bash Node.js. It just happens to be such a big repository. We're doing an uh, analysis of their supply chain dependency graph to understand uh, what we call deep supply chain dependencies. And uh, it's millions and millions of packages and many of them, like there's a couple of very big offenders of this, like that they make a package for the color red and then they make a package for ANSI colors and then they make a package for coloring things. So you have this very long tails of packages that can be compromised uh, and all of them essentially inject code. Uh, um, so it's, it, it is a very interesting ecosystem to say the least. I just want to say, Matt, Matt. Sure. Um, I have a uh, quick question on that presentation. You mentioned you touched on the FedRAM, and I'm curious, I think you were suggesting probably that the CSS certification could be a precursor or a step towards going towards the FedRAM. Can you elaborate on that one and how, if, if there is any official link up on that as to getting the FedRAM certification through the CSA, or is this totally decoupled and just a, an exercise in getting that? So honestly, a FedRAM certification is only given by the government, uh, the government ATO, right? Yeah. Um, but the controls that CSA validates as part of the CCM are mapped to FedRAM uh, and NEST 800-53 as well. Um, I know NEST works closely with CSA as well. Uh, so there's um, interdependencies there and they share data between each other, um, all the controls, et cetera. But what I'm saying is FedRAM aud audit process is quite stringent. I have talked to Microsoft uh, Azure team and they have auditors sitting on their site 24 seven, 365 days. So you can imagine the number of resources Microsoft has to spend to continually keep their FedRAM certification. It's not practical for a small time SaaS provider to do that, right? Um, it's expensive uh, in terms of resources, in terms of effort that they have to put in place. So if I'm a small application provider that is now providing it as a software as a service, I don't have time and money and resources to have FedRAM auditors sitting in and forcing all those in the state under 53 controls 24 seven, 365 days. And uh, I may not even have resources to secure everything as per NIST 800-53. I mean, even large enterprises are having challenges just meeting the NIST 800-53 controls. So we can't expect that our small time SaaS providers or medium enterprises, medium sized enterprises as well. So um, they use CCM, uh, uh, the CSA audit results to show that their practices are still secure, even if they are not up to the level of FedRAM certification. So is it, uh, are those, myself clear? Yeah, are those audits then from the CSA um, recognized by the FedRAM as the acceptable? No, FedRAM doesn't accept anything other than FedRAM, right? Okay. So it, it does speak to that. <laughs> so it, it, uh, yeah, I was just wondering whether there is any advantage or leverage one could draw by doing this uh, while they are actually working towards the FedRAM, getting the FedRAM um, so, But But this CSA audit works for other organizations, right? Uh, I work right. for a financial services organization, uh, organization. For every SaaS solution, I would validate whether, whether they have FedRAM or they have ISO or they have CSA, either of the three. And that gives me some level of assurance of their security practices. And then I can do more due diligence based on my assessment from their audit findings if I need to do that, right? So I'm baseline control, may, at just, least you get some sense of. I'm just gonna step in. We have about two minutes on the clock before hard stop. And I uh, just want to offer if anyone wants to continue this discussion to either if you want to post your contact details in chat or a link to uh, in Slack if anyone wants to continue. I was just going to save the very last minute and ask if there are any attendees today that would like to quickly introduce themselves before we wrap up.
All right, so then uh, I'll just conclude with Emily, uh, put a note here in the chat, uh, by all means, hop onto the CNCF Slack join the SIG Secure channel. And uh, if anyone would like to continue this discussion there, and thank you uh, Edna, for that. So it looks like we've got all the pieces needed to continue this offline. So anyone to stay on the call, please feel free to, but at least uh, at this moment, we're officially ending uh, the meeting. Uh, have a great day, everyone, and stay healthy. Thank you very much. Have a good day. Thank you. Thanks, Matt.